Next topic we're going to be talking about today is jaundice. You probably heard about this, so if you've seen it or not, uh, heard about it. Uh, I think to fully understand jaundice, uh, understanding the metabolism of bilirubin is extremely crucial. And that's what I'm going to walk you guys through with this pathway I've got mapped out on the right side of, this, uh, of, the, of the board because if you don't understand this pathway, you can't really appreciate when you see a patient that looks yellow. Ooh, they're looking yellow for a reason. That's why I'm here. I always remember that. We talk about mechanisms. We talk about pathophysiology. That's what I'm here for. That's the bread and butter. All right? So we need to understand a few things. And as I'm going to go down this list, I want you to carefully follow me. I'm going to go as slow as possible and try to reiterate some concepts so that when we talk about jaundice, which is basically yellow discoloration of the skin, mucous membranes, your eyes, the sclera, due to overproduction or underclearance of bilirubin. So let's jump on the bandwagon. So we got red blood cells right in our body running 24 hours a day for 120 days, not 365 days a year. Yeah, they do run for 365 days a year, but not the same guy. All right, so I'm going to tell you a little story. Red blood cells are very fragile. They look like a nice little Burger King or is it Burger King. Yeah, Burger King. you know, Burger King donuts, right? They look like little Burger King donuts. But these no nuts are very friable. They're made of spectrum, right? You kind of look at a nice donut. It's a lot of stuff on the red blood cells. The societal skeleton that keeps it, you know, alive. It's not just like water or something. Like it actually has a skeletal structure to it. It has a lot of what? Hemoglobin molecules, millions of them, right? Sitting on top. This kind of spectrum molecules, you know, kind of just holding a lot of things in anchor. So it's a pretty important um, cell. It does a lot of job. What is the job of red blood cell, right? It captures oxygen. And that oxygen is what we need for what? The oxidase phosphorylation reaction in the mitochondrion that keeps us alive. But that's not the topic of today. We're going to be talking about the red blood cell. So, a normal red blood cell's lifespan is 120 days. That's three months. That's only three months. So every time we crank up a new red blood cell from your bone marrow, right? This is not a um, hematological le lecture, so we're not gonna talk about how they're made, but the point is they're made, and once they're made, they're cranking out. Cute little baby red blood cells, right? Right, forward match. They walk out, they move on, they get out, they're like, here you go nice outside. It's a lot of water. Let's get some oxygen so we can keep this patient alive. Uh, right? However, towards the end of time, after 120 days, they start to walk, after 119, 18, 19, they start to walk with a little stick. And now because what? They're constantly going through what? Blood vessels. They go from the aorta, they go down to the arterial levels, right? They go down to the capillary. They squeeze it between capillaries to do that. They wiggle out, they're not that strong. But as they start to age, the cell membranes are weak. They're not as strong anymore. They're walking through the capillaries like, ah, 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 ah. And when they move out, eventually you're gonna end up in the what? In the spleen. That's their graveyard. In the spleen, because in medicine, when we know you're about to know something, we switch the name. Why? Under the skin, we have macrophages. Inside the lungs, we have macrophages, right? In the liver, we have macrophages. Inside the spleen, we have macrophages. In the brain, we have macrophages. You know what pisses me off? It's the same guy with a different label. If it's in the spleen, they call them a fancy name, reticular endothelial cells. Ooh, that's a big mouthful. If they're under your skin, Call them Langerhans cells. If they're inside your what? Um, lungs, they call them type 2 pneumocytes. You're like, oh my god, what's that? It's still the same microphage. If it's inside your brain, they 
call them glial cells, astrocytes, fancy names. Who cares? He's the same dude. And my fault. But we know, so occasionally it's a microfish, right? So this microfish is looking nice and cute, and it's 120 day old red blood cell is walking and walking with a little stick. It gets in there, the macrophage is waiting for it inside a spin, like, honey, time up. They get him, they squash him into two, they break him apart, all the hemoglobin falls apart, the heme groups, they fall apart, the protein falls apart, the heme is left out, and the heme is converted by an enzyme called heme oxygenase, right? It's what converts him to bilirubin. Once bilirubin is made, bilirubin can't just be floating around. No, we don't want that floating around. He comes out, it's like, huh, where do I go? Like, oh, oh, hold up, hold up, but it's a little protein in our body that's called the transporter, right? It's got a little pocket. It's waiting for the bilirubin. It sticks in there because we need to put in a little pocket, we put bilirubin in there, and we ship it, and we ship it because this is UPS, right? So UPS comes around, UPS is going to pick him up, the package is going to be packaged now, the little, little packets of bilirubin with albumin, and we take it all the way down to the liver. However, this is where you need to focus on conjugated bilirubin. What's that? Well, on conjugated. What do you mean it's not conjugated? Well, it's not conjugated. We're going to talk about what makes it conjugated, right? So it goes to the liver, and what happens? The UPS guy, he drops it, he goes away. That's the albumin. He goes back to the blood, where it carries more. Because there's a lot more red blood cells are dying inside the spleen, right? When he gets into the liver. Now, unconjugated, I want you to focus on the cell. This is an hepatocyte. They are parasites at the cells inside the liver. What they do is they're going to conjugate the bilirubin. And what do they do? They're going to have uridine. It's one of those funky amino acids, right? Uridine. They're going to use an enzyme called uridine glucuronyl transfer. So I'm like, hmm, UGT, what does that stand for? That means it's a transferring uridine onto an unconjugated bilirubin. Now, look at this unconjugated bilirubin. It's not too happy. He wants a Yankee hat, right? Right? All of a sudden, once he gets to uridine, it becomes conjugated. So what's the difference between unconjugated and conjugated? This guy is not water soluble. That's why it's not soluble inside your blood. We need albumin to carry it. Once it's coming out of the liver, it's like, yeah, look at that, I got my Yankee hat. It can jump into the water and become soluble, but it's not going to go into the water. The liver is going to secrete it straight into your gallbladder and stall it as bile with a bile acid. Are you following? Good. Now, once we get into the gallbladder, here's where the fun begins. Now, we know how bilirubin is made because that's our problem with jaundice. The gallbladder is going to secret the bilirubin when you what? When you need bile, especially for emulsification of fats, right? Once this is made under the influence of cystocholecystokinin, CCK, right? Cholecystokinin, the bilirubin is now going to spill, the bile is going to spill into your bowel, right? It's going to go into the gut. Look at that. It goes into your gut. It's going to do what it's got to do. 100% of it is going in, however, we don't want to waste it, right? So 80% is going to go into the entire gut, and here is bacteria just sitting there, breaking this extra little bit of rubin products down the, 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 into stracobilin. The stracobilin is what makes poop the brown, green, yellow, whatever color your poop looks like. You, Yeah, I know. But that's the point. Now, out of so 80% goes in, and then 20% because we don't want to waste all of it. 20% is going to be reabsorbed back into the what the portal system. But of that 20%, I want you to focus of that 20%, 90% of the 20% is going to go back and be stored back into the liver, which is good. It's going back to the liver, but 10%. 
a little bit, you're gonna spill it into what? Into the blood. When you get into the liver, it gets into what? It's from the portal vein. If you haven't seen the anatomy of the liver, we talk specifically about this in portal hypertension. You can go back to the lecture and watch it. The liver is not gonna dump out a little bit of the bilirubin, right? Into your bloodstream. It's not gonna go to what? The kidneys. When it gets to the kidneys, get filtered out, and what do you have? Get a color. It, form, it forms urobilin, which keeps your urine yellow. Yellow. Now, what is jaundice? Let's go back to the definition. Jaundice is yellow discoloration of the skin, the mucous membrane, your sclera. Ah, now it makes sense. If my urine is yellow, when it's getting into the urine, if it's not in the urine and it's inside my eye, what do you think I'm going to look like? That's right. It's going to cause jaundice. That's excellent understanding of the pathophysiology of jaundice. Now that we know that, now when does jaundice become a problem? We already defined it. So when this patient's not going to come in, you're going to look into their eyes, it's going to be really yellow, right? And you tell them to actually, the, the, before they notice their eyes, if they actually stick out their tongue and did this, and you look under the frenulum, it's yellow. So you want to pick that up. Then eventually, if it's too much, it starts to spill on the skin. So now, let's go over what I actually, what causes excess amount of bilirubin in our body. So, now that we understand this pathway, should I do this or not? All right. I want us to focus here, so um, let's put a line. All right. So, join this. Your goal is to be able to know if it's pathological. If it's pathologic, pathologic jaundice is usually when the total bilirubin is greater than two. That's when it's pathologic. That's a lot. We normally have bilirubin, but when it's greater than two, it becomes a problem. So you want to know that. Milligram per deciliter is just a unit. So, in order to understand jaundice, we need to know, I do you have unconjugated bilirubin, right, or is a conjugated bilirubin because this is very important once you know it you have to split your brain into two you have to know where it's coming from so I'm gonna have to draw out exact actually we don't have to uh, I'm gonna erase this part since we already know how where unconjugated is coming from and we're just gonna leave it from the unconjugated part. Because I want you to see here that once they come out here, this is the conjugated part, okay? But I still have to draw out anatomy so you can see uh, a little bit of uh, understand. So this is our cute looking liver, right? And it's got uh, coming out of it are the biliary and the cystic. There you go. All right. It's got a nice cute looking pancreas in there. Coming together here, we form our sphincter of OD again. Going to the duodenum. And I always like to draw here is my hepatic vein, which is gonna go into the inferior vena cava, okay? This is hepatic vein. Okay, and this is the liver. Because this will give us a very good understanding. And there's a whole slew of arteries coming that connects eventually from your spleen to the liver. So it's important that you just, it's very complicated, so I'm not even gonna go through that. Now, we need to know what causes conjugated versus unconjugated bilirubin. And usually, when we get to the labs, I'll talk about what it looks like and how you calculate things. So, 
when the urine is positive for bilirubin and it's conjugated, the two things is going on, right? If it's conjugated, it can be caused by a decreased intrahepatic excretion of bilirubin or an extrahepatic biliary obstruction. Huh, that's two fancy names. So what are we saying is, if there's decreased excretion, right, intrahepatic excretion of bilirubin out of the liver, you can have a lot of conjugated. So if there's a problem here, do you see that? Actually, sorry, they already conjugated. If there's a problem here, that's where the problem is. Because it's already conjugated, right? We're talking about conjugated here. All right. But I think that would confuse you. So let's start with unconjugated first because it will be like we're starting from unconjugated to conjugated. So I'm going to back up a little bit. So back to the notes. When people have unconjugated bilirubin in the urine, because that's where we're going to find it when we test it with urine dip. Oh, wow, that's interesting, right? It's either you're making a lot of bilirubin and your body can take too much of it, or can't control how to uh, control it, or there's a reduced hepatic uptake of the bilirubin for conjugation. So what do we mean by that? For unconjugated, the most common thing that cause a lot of unconjugated bilirubin is what? Hemolysis. Right? Now, hemolysis on its own is so many things that can cause hemolysis. That's a huge lecture. But if you condense it down, basically we're chopping off too much red blood cells. It's a lot of things. Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. If you have uh, aortic stenosis, if you have a valve in there, it could be intravascular hemolysis, it could be extravascular hemolysis, it could be autoimmune hemolysis. At the bottom line, I don't really care what breaks the, um, let me see, uh, the red blood cell. Whether it's hereditary spherocytosis, proximal noxonal hemoglobinuria, you gotta, you know, who cares? The red blood cells broken in too much. You're cranking up and cranking up and cranking up and breaking down and breaking down and breaking down. Too much red blood cells. What do you think gonna happen? Remember that pathway. You're cranking up a lot of bilirubin more than your your body can handle. So you crank them up and eventually you oversaturate your liver. This guy starts what? Spill into the urine. Actually, they're gonna. I'm sorry. Spill into your bloodstream. So that will be on. Unconjugated. You see that guy? It's gonna be unconjugated because your hemolysis and bring down too much red blood cell. This is my favorite. The liver might have a re reduced uptake of the bilirubin. What syndrome is very common? And you need to know this. This is high yield, super high yield information. A friend of yours probably got it. So John is a 17 year old male. He's got seven exams coming up next week. He's stressed out. John is stressed. He's on his stress. He can't even handle too much information. His car broke down. His girlfriend broke up with him. That's bad, right? All of a sudden, he stands in front of the mirror one day and is like, geez, my eyes is yellow, right? That's very, and you, you check, we check a blood work, and he has a lot of, Elevated unconjugated urine. I'm sorry, bilirubin. And we said because the urine is always negative, right? Guess what he has? Joubert syndrome. It's not Gilbert. It's called Joubert's syndrome. All right. Usually, young people, every time they are stressed out, they can't. They, their body, their liver can't really handle a matter for unconjugated bilirubin that's coming through so they look yellow, the jaundice, you do nothing about it a week later, life is good, they bought a brand new car the girlfriend came back, they've got AIDS straighters on the exam and they're booming, they're black, you know, the car in the hallway, in the highway and bam, they look good it comes off and on always with stress so no Jibir syndrome that's one problem the second one is I mean, the third one in this case is called Craig Niger syndrome. Uh, I don't Krigler Niger. Sorry, Krigler Niger. That's how you say. It. 
and syndrome. There's a type 1 and a type 2. Bottom line with Kriglin IJ, which is usually very common, is because these patients don't have uridine glucuronyl transferase. If you don't have this enzyme, what happens? This guy can't go through, he can't go through, right? He gets blocked this way, everything in backs up, they get a lot of unconjugated bilirubin. All right, this is a genetic defect. They're just missing the enzyme. That's why, so you gotta know that. It's extremely important. How about this? Newborn baby, I see this all the time. The first time I saw it, I'm like, yay! I was so excited. I walk into the OBGYN clinic, I walked upstairs in L and D, and I looked to my right, and I saw a blue light, and I'm like, hmm, what's that? It was a Billy light. <coughs> Billy light? I'm like, I read about that before. I saw the baby, <coughs> what is that? It looks yellow. The baby had physiologic jaundice. Unbelievable, because this enzyme is not matured yet, they can't really, and they're breaking down a lot of their red blood cells they got from mom, transfusion right during the baby delivery. It's a lot of, you know, a little bit of exchange with the mom's red blood cells, right? And they're also like the fetal red blood cells have been broken now. All of a sudden, they look a little, little yellow, right? And then, because they're newborn, what do we do? We put them on the billy light. And the billy light is what breaks the hydrogen bonds, breaks it apart, and all of a sudden they feel better. So you gotta know that physiologic jaundice that causes it. How about this? If the, everything is always good until the liver stops working. If I have liver cirrhosis and this co liver is completely knocked out, what do you think when this unconjugated bilirubin is trying to go in? It's like, huh? Right? We're going home and we get home, the home is burnt down. It's erotic, it's hard as a rock. Sorry, dude. Cirrhosis. Okay? So, unfortunately, there's not much we can do but that. Diffuse liver damage. Right? Last but not the least, drugs. Notorious. Sulfur drugs. Sulfonamides. They're notoriously known for causing penicillin, rifampin. These are all hepatotoxic drugs that can also cause you to have elevated bilirubin. Okay? Also, radio contrast agents. So now that we know this, you look like a rock star. You can basically think in your head once you have the pathway memorized, like, oh, it's every, if it's unconjugated, it's anything that's eaten in here. Good. Now, let's go to conjugated because they made it. They got a Yankee hat. They're conjugated, they're water soluble, they're like, we are matching on and we are going home. Let's see what happens. Part two. All right, so for conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, where's well, the problem? Problem is here, they made it. My little friend here made, he's got a hat, and that has to go into the gallbladder. So if he has to come out, he got to come out this way and go into the gallbladder, go into the duodenum. So if I block this area and I close the door shut, bam, on this dude, what do you think gonna happen? Ain't nowhere to go now. What are you going to do? So what do we do? Extra hepatic or biliary obstruction. That's the most common thing, right? Not the most common, but one of the, like, an extra, extra mean outside, hepatic, the liver, obstruction, right? You ever been on the highway before, and you're driving, and you're so excited, and all of a sudden you see, slow down, 45 miles per hour, and you move a little closer, and you're like, wait a minute, there's a roadblock ahead. That pisses you off. Yeah, it pisses me off too, right? Roadblocks. What kind of roadblocks? Let's start. If I get strictures of this, the common bile ducts, like what? Primary sclerosing cholangitis, which we already made a lecture on that. 
primary biliary cirrhosis, intrahepatic autoimmune destruction, right? You want to know that. How about if I have a cancer right here, just sitting over there? A huge pancreatic cancer at the head of the pancreas, right? What do you think is going to happen? It's going to block that. Nothing can go through. So pancreatic cancer. And I'm going to tell you about pancreatic cancer in a minute because it's very bad. People that have pancreatic cancer, they don't know they have it. They'll wake up. I had a patient tell me, a husband just woke up one morning and looked at her wife. It's like, honey, your eyes are yellow. She's like, really? I feel fine. I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. No abdominal pain, nothing. It's usually painless jaundice. It's scary. They go into the hospital. We work them up. We do a CAT scan of their abdomen. And bam, there's this huge cancer at the head of the pancreas just sitting there. And now that's bad prognosis. They're not going to last more than six months. They can let, you know, they can last up to, you know, even the five-year survival is very low. That's what uh, the CEO of uh, Apple had, okay, Steve Jobs. He had pancreatic cancer. He probably woke up one morning, he had yellow eyes. Now, another thing you need to know, aside from the obstruction, what else? You can actually call gallstones, right? A stone can be sitting here, right? If a stone is sitting over here, over here, right? Obstruction, anything that obstructs, right? So I will put gallstones on top of my list. Gallstones, know that, extremely important. How about you have a cancer of the biliary tree? It's called what? Cholangiocarcinoma. Cholangiocarcinoma. Right? That's another tumor of the intrahepatic ducts when they're coming out of the liver. It's right always sitting over there. It's called Klatskin's tumor. Very low yield, but it would be nice to know. It could be that's what's causing it. All right? How about in Down, Down syndrome patient? They develop something we call biliary atresia. The biliary tree actually becomes arthritic. It looks like that. Cuts off. So every time they conjugate, nothing can come out. So biliary atresia, atresia will cause it. Can you see how extra hepatic obstruction, which is this, you can just toss anything in there obstruct. You know what? You can take your, you know, take your pencil and just slash it off and start making up a differential of what can cause conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, but that's just part one. Let's move on to part two of part one. All right? Aside from extra hepatic obstruction, remember, this stuff got to go through the liver too, right? This guy can, is still in the liver, right? It gets conjugated. It's still taking a walk. It's a little hat. This is on his way out by the door and it's excited, right? So, if I have liver cirrhosis, and just this part of the liver is cirrhotic. I can develop on con I mean, conjugated bilirubinemia. How about, how about this? There's two inherited diseases you need to know. Dubin-Johnson and Rutter syndrome. Dubin-Johnson and Rutter syndrome. And these two syndromes are notoriously known for causing elevated, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. But there's something special about Magic Johnson. Well, he's Dubin this one, but Magic Johnson is a black guy. I know. But it's the reason why I say he's a black guy. Everybody knows that because Dubin Johnson has a black liver when they do biopsy eventually. That's how you differentiate between Dubin Johnson and Rotor. And the problem is a decreased excretion problem. It's right by the door. They can't excrete. It's an inherited problem. So on your boards, they're going to say, oh, a patient had a black liver, and they're going to put Rotor syndrome, and they're going to put Dubin Johnson. So I say, how in the world am I going to remember Dubin Johnson he has a black liver? Oh, say Magic Johnson is the guy with the that played basketball back in the 80s, right? And he retired. 
He's black. I know. But his name is Johnson. So that's how you remember that. Keep that at the back of your mind. All right? Also, what you need to know is primary biliary cirrhosis. We talked about that. Primary sclerosis cholangitis. We did talk about that already. Drugs. Blood control pills can cause it. This is another thing you need to note, note about, okay? Anything that affects the liver also, hepatocellularly, uh, cirrhosis, viral hepatitis, all that good stuff, okay? And that's it, guys. That's how you differentiate between conjugated and unconjugated. Now, what you need to know about conjugated and unconjugated in terms of symptoms is this. Now that, we've, now that you know the pathology behind it, the pathophysiology behind it, right? And what they're going to present with, they're going to look yellow. So there's really no, you know, they're going to come in yellow. A little bit yellow in the eyes, yellow frenulum, yellow skin. So we already know what the symptoms are. It's yellow skin, right? That's what jaundice is all about, right? On physical exam, your physical exam can point or may not because if they have a gallstone and you press on the right upper quadrant, you might be telling they have a possible cholecholithiasis. Okay? But the key thing is the urine. Now, if they have unconjugated, remember I told you unconjugated, I the new guys, they're so excited, they are not water soluble. If they are not soluble in water, they are not going to be able to go through the kidneys. They are going to bypass the kidney and go back into the body. Bypass the kidney and go back into the body. So your urine, your urine is going to be clear. Okay? But you are going to ask the patient the question. Ma, uh, Mrs. Uh, Johnson, how is your urine? What color is it? Oh, it is dark. It's kind of dark color. Ah, if the yellow and the urine is dark, you should be thinking at the back of your head, it's not unconjugated because if it's unconjugated, so urine shouldn't be dark, right? It's not water soluble. The only thing that's water soluble is the conjugated one, right? So if this bad boy is spilling into the urine, right, and it's water soluble, it's gonna take a good match. It's gonna go into the kidneys, filter down the sink, go down the drain, it's gonna come out, and the pee is gonna be black. And you're gonna be like, ooh, voila without even ordering labs. That makes you a genius. But you don't know what causes it, right? Because we know there's so many things that can cause it. So what we're gonna do, we ask them if the urine is dark, if the urine, you look at the urine, if it's negative, and you tell them, pee me cup for me, and you're like, oh, okay, that looks fine. If the pee, and it looks like dark, we've got a problem. You should be thinking, this bad boy is already conjugated. Physical exam, like I showed you, it's is it non-specific? It could be specific because you don't know what's causing it. So we're going to order some labs. Right? When we order our labs, because it's the liver, what do you think? We're going to have a liver function test. See how the liver function is it? It is, right? Because if they have an hepatitis going on, if they have a, some kind of like liver cirrhosis, we're going to be able to know. Since this has to go to what? It's going to go to the gallbladder. I wouldn't mind ordering some alkaline phosphatase with some GGT because if this is elevated it's telling me mm, it could be some biliary problem right because it's a biliary problem remember if it's the biliary tree that's affected it's a lot of things that can affect it right however when we order also liver functional tests aside from the AST and ALT we're going to order what the bilirubin levels are and now let's this is where the bread and butter is. When bilirubin comes back from the lab, it comes back as total bilirubin and they give you uh, the unconjugated, or actually the conjugated bilirubin. Conjugated bilirubin. That's what you get back from the lab. So let's say this is four and this is uh, three. No, yeah, three. If you sub the only way you get the, and they don't tell you what the unconjugated is, what do you do? You subtract. You do this, uh, I put a, put a minus sign, you do that, and you say four minus three is one. So therefore the unconjugated bilirubin is gonna be one. So automatically you know it's the conjugated billion that's very high. I'm gonna be a, give you a bigger number, so let's give it a fourteen. Fourteen and make let's make this seven. Alright? Actually, mm, 
let's make this uh, 11 because that will make it really really obvious or because mm, your billy ruby is usually like 0 0.1 to like 1 anyway so I mean that's a lot so I'll make this actually uh, 13 okay the reason why I make that so you can see big numbers so big numbers mean big things big things mean bad things right so this is telling us somebody's got to conjugate it happen a little bit, little bit yeah. okay so we did all the liver function we checked the ability ribbon we're checking the what ALT ALT uh, AST we checked the albumin level why would we check albumin remember that is the UPS guy the UPS guy is not around hmm let's see Nobody can carry these guys to the liver. So you want to make sure they have bilirubin, uh, albumin in their body. It's the protein that's going to help them carry the complex, okay? We also also PT. I know people said uh, they couldn't find part four of our uh, a liver function test, but we use the PT INR time to measure the function of the liver. Because the liver makes a lot of coagulation factors. When the liver is dead, your PT is going to be high, okay? So you want to know that, all right? Now, now that we've checked all the labs, you basically have to work up this patient. And working up this patient, you know, depends on what your lab values are going to give you, okay? If the liver function says abnormal, right, you know something is wrong with the liver. If, if something, uh, you know, you might need, you know, uh, if it's cirrhosis, the only way you can diagnose it is a biopsy. If your alkaline phosphate is high and your GGT is high, you know it's a biliary problem. It could be a stone. Take the right quadrant ultrasound, you check, you find a stone in there, you just find out what's causing it, okay? All right, we do a CAT scan, all right, to see the abdomen. We might be able to see the pancreatic cancer just sitting over there. So these are serious conditions, okay? And we have all these other diagnostics tests we need to diagnose. Now, if you think it's an intrahepatic problem, right? And there's a lot of things that can cause intrahepatic problems. If it's primary biliary cirrhosis, you will order an anti-mitochondrial antibody, an AMA. If it's autoimmune hepatitis, because if you realize it's an hepatitis from your LFTs, if it's autoimmune, you order anti-smooth muscle. I know, high yield information, good stuff, right? If it's uh, lupus, you want to order an AMA, ANA, anti-nucleic acid antibody, right? If it's uh, a virus, you check a viral level, right? You want to check if it's hepatitis B, C, or uh, D uh, might be causing it. Uh, if it's even alpha-1 antitrypsin, I know these are all the things we haven't really talked about, but these are the different things that can cause alpha-1 antitrypsin is a deficiency in that enzyme, and it can cause liver damage. It also cause you to get emphysema, okay? All right? If it's drugs, what do we do? We stop the drugs. Stay, stay away from the drugs, okay? All right, and basically that's pretty much it, guys. That's how we work up jaundice. All right, once you know if it's conjugated or unconjugated, you're pretty much good to go. So in summary, just to kind of summarize everything I've said in a few words, we talked about the pathophysiology of how bilirubin is made. We talked about the causes, right? We split it into two. For somebody to look yellow, they have to have unconjugated or conjugated. So unconjugated, you want to focus on this guy. It's something along that pathway, maybe hemolysis, too much red blood cell breakdown, Joubert syndrome, okay? You want to know that. Those are even physiologic, physiologic diseases of the newborn. That's extremely important that you know that. Because you're going to see when you're on your pediatric rotation. They're going to show you to you, you're going to be like, hmm, I know what that is, right? Okay? If it's conjugated, on the other side of things, it could be intrahepatic problem or extrahepatic. If it's inside the liver, all those little things I talk about, PBS, PSC, autoimmune antibodies binding to your liver, cirrhosis, uh, um, also uh, liver damage um, from drugs. If it's outside, it could be a stone, it could be ca pancreatic cancer. Those are really bad, right? Stone, we can take out, we just use ERCP, we go in there, we pluck it out. But with pancreatic cancer, it's pretty bad. Bad prognosis. You do some surgery and all this complicated stuff. Okay? All right? If it's cholangiocarcinoma, if something on here, you want to watch out for it. Okay? And so, and the list just goes on. All right? 
So that's the end of jaundice. That's how we work it up. Now you fully understand the pathophysiology of bilirubin metabolism. I hope this was a very helpful lecture for you guys. And uh, I'll see you again next time. Take it easy. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. And that's our end of our lecture.